Welcome to a well-designed business with your host, Luan Nigara. Luann has a lifetime of experience building a multi-million dollar business with her husband and cousin, and she knows the challenges you face in your interior design business. Luann brings you real-life answers to your most pressing problems, as well as practical strategies to explode your interior design business. So, let's get to the business of interior design. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. It's Power Talk Friday. I'm very excited and happy to introduce all of you to Stefan Spencer. Hi, Stefan. How are you? I'm doing great, Luann. Thank you. So here's the thing. Stefan and I actually actually met in person just a couple of weeks ago. Well, at the time of this recording, we met a couple of weeks ago at Podcast Movement in Anaheim. He was already scheduled to be on my show, and we had a chance really quickly to talk. It was so chaotic there, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, exhilarating and chaotic at the same time. Um, but I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about Stefan. He is an SEO expert. He is a best-selling author. He has three books, all published by O'Reilly, and one of them is The Art of SEO. The other is Social E-Commerce, and the other is Google Power Search. He had founded a multinational SEO agency called Net Concepts in 95, and he sold it in 2010. His client's roster, his client roster includes Zappos, Sony, Quicksilver, and Chanel. And in addition to that, and this is why I guess we ran into each other at Podcast Movement, he has two podcasts. The one is called The Optimized Geek, and the other one is called Marketing Speak. So here Here's a thing. I just want to tell everybody how we first met. We were in a mastermind together with my friend Edie Berg, who was running it on what's happening in podcasts, what the future is. And Stefan was there and he put his book on the table, on the middle of the table. We were all at a big round table. And that thing is about five inches thick, I'm just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so funny because you're like, well, if you wanted to know about SEO, I have this book here. And you put it down. I, I mean, honestly, God, it's thicker than the Bible. Let's be real. It is, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at the woman sitting next to me and I said, if anybody in their right mind thinks I could understand three pages of that, they're at, they're crazy. I mean, there's no way. But I just, it totally made me just look at you and go, what goes on in that man's brain? <laughs> So, a lot apparently yeah. that's it that's it so so i was like well i guess i've got an seo expert on the way to my show so <laughs> i've been looking forward to it since and um we're going to talk about that because there's a lot of i actually have a lot of really good questions related to seo and of course you as a podcast host and a well-prepared podcast guest, you know, hinted a few questions to me in an email, which is very helpful. I can't tell you how helpful that is, right? You know how helpful that is. But um, I'm naturally curious about this topic to begin with. But before we do that, Stefan, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the other podcast that you have and the reason and the mission for it. You, The other podcast is called The Optimized Geek. And there you really spend time speaking to people about how to improve improve their health, how to improve their wealth, and how to reboot their life. And I thought that was a little interesting just to give some background on who you were, because I, I learned it in my research. You didn't put it, you know, foot forward when you, we, you and I introduced each other and when you introduced yourself by email either. So I just thought it was a fun, interesting thing to find out about you and to put some layers into your life. Would you share with us, I particularly would love for my listeners to hear the Tony Robbins story. <laughs> of course, yes. So I was in 2009 uh, going through a divorce and I was really unhappy, depressed, uh, frankly. And uh, three different friends independently came up to me at various points that year and said, you got to go to this Tony Robbins event. Mm -hmm. It's called Unleash the Power Within. Yeah. And I just thought, who the heck, isn't that like the infomercial guy? <laughs> I knew nothing about him. Oh. So I decided I need to do something because clearly I was not in a good place. I was really down in the dumps and I, I, I was going to, you know, be out in the dating scene and whatever. And, and I, I just knew I was not going to have any success. You had to get your success. game on, right? <laughs> yeah, and I had, I had zero game. I was. Uh, if you look at the Optimized Geek website, 
on the about page, so optimizegeek.com slash about, you'll see a before and after photo. Mm. And it's shocking. <laughs> it's, yes, it is. They, they are completely different people. You never recognize one from the other. And so I knew I needed some help to reboot my life, do something. Uh, so I went and it was incredible. I did this, um, you know, fire walk on 2000 degree hot coals and my bare feet. And it was at that moment after finishing walking across those hot coals that I, well, first of all, was like ecstatic, like, wow, I was able to do that and not burn myself. And I thought, well, if I can do that, if I can overcome my fear to walk on hot coals, I can do anything. And so two weeks later, I went and got LASIK surgery. I'd been terrified my whole life of getting my eyes operated on, so I always had to wear glasses or, or contacts, but I'd been wearing glasses for you know many years. And then I, two months later, I got a hair transplant, I changed my diet, I started working out. I became literally unrecognizable over the course of those 12 months after that event. Wow. And then I also joined other, um, I, go, I, I joined Tony Robbins' uh, Platinum Partnership uh, about a year uh, after starting this journey and followed Tony around the world and did all these amazing uh, experiences, things like uh, going to Egypt and Israel and uh, Cabo and Fiji and everything. It was really amazing and um, you know, breaking through all sorts of fears and everything, going, uh, for example, micro lighting above Victoria Falls in Zambia, Whoa. which is like a, it's a hang glider with a motor attached. And there was Whoa. a pilot there, but I had this really severe fear of heights and I was able to conquer that. Uh, there was a guy there on that trip who worked with people who were afraid to do the shark dive, uh, which was later in the week. <laughs> I was also afraid of that because I don't know how to swim and I oh really God. don't like water. So it was amazing. And, and that was just one example. Of, I'm just scratching the surface of all the benefits of doing the Platinum Partnership thing. But it all started at this $700 event called mm. Unleash the Power Within, doing the firewalk. And that was the catalyst for a complete, total life reboot. And so I want to share that with the world, all the stuff I learned by going to these different masterminds, being part of Platinum Partnership for three years. Um, I'm not in it anymore, but it was amazing. And all these other seminars and, and masterminds and um, all the experts that I've met, bring those to my, uh, my listeners mm -hmm. and share that with the world. And then I want to write a book, which I'm in process uh, uh, on, and use all those interviews as fodder for the book, as well as my own life story. It's really, it's something, I mean, you and I don't know each other very well, but my listeners know that because I, you know, tell them all the time how I grew up reading Tony Robbins and Og Mandino and Wayne Dwyer and, you know, Napoleon Hill and Zig Ziglar and Dale Carnegie. I mean, honestly, from 10 years old, I started reading these books. I had tended, my daughter, my youngest is 28, and I we had gone to a Tony Robbins event when she was in middle school or high school. So that's how long ago that was. Um, but it is, I think what you're expressing is what I often say is that it's one thing to be inspired by something. It's another thing to take action on something. Um, my keynote signature speech is excellence is a decision. And it really all centers around that exact principle that because being in that audience is life changing. I mean, I believe uh -huh. that it is. It is. It's in. And the thing is, but it's like, what do you do when you leave the audience? And when I heard your story and was reading about it and I thought, well, that is some kind of decision making going yeah. on there. <laughs> so I just um, really admire it. And I wanted to give you a chance to share it because I know it's important to you. And I think it's an important message to anybody who might be in this position. I mean, this is a business show. It's straight up a business show. But, you know, people listening, 
they've become my friends, whether I've met them or I haven't met them. And I feel like sometimes there comes along a message that you need to hear. And, you know, maybe it's going to come to you from a business podcast. I don't know. But when I was doing my research on you, I thought, you know what, we're going to take a minute with that. So thank you (laughs) for sharing that with us and giving us that inspiration, because it really is a remarkable journey, what you've been through and what you've accomplished. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. No, no, no. Thank you. So, all right. Now, let's talk SEO, because this subject may makes me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just seems like what? So, so let's just start in case anybody is not familiar. What would you say when we say what, why it matters, what, what it does and what it doesn't do and why it matters? Just give us that to give us a groundwork. And then from there, I'm going to grill the heck out of you. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. So the, the, the thing is, if people are turning to Google for answers to their questions, and to do their research, to do their due diligence before hiring an interior designer, they need to see you in the search results, otherwise you lose credibility. If you're not there for even a company name search, that's the worst, that shows that you're just completely clueless or invisible. It's like looking in the white pages, remember back in the day mm-hmm. when we had white pages? <laughs> I do. And not finding your company listed. And it's right. like, what, what the heck's with that? You know, mm-hmm. why is your, why does XYZ company not even in the white pages? Now, you could also apply that same logic to the yellow pages and say, well, I'm looking for a plumber and uh, XYZ plumbing company's not in there or you know, the interior designer of, uh, you know, XYZ companies not showing up under interior designers in the old pages. Are they even legit? Right. Is this a fly by night outfit? Am I going to end up getting uh, snookered or whatever? So apply that now to these days. People search on Google to see that you're legit and, or that, you know, you might, even, might not even make it into the consideration set because they're doing a search for interior design or interior designers or whatever, and you're not showing up in the search results. So they contact your competitors and they never think to contact you because they never see you in the Google search. That's a layer that I hadn't considered before. Obviously, I knew the layer of if someone Google searches interior designer in their hometown and you're in that town, you don't show up, you lose an opportunity for business. But it hadn't occurred to me that it was a credibility factor because when you say it in relation to the old school white pages and yellow pages, I, that totally rings true. I can remember looking for people and, you know, companies or whatever for their phone number and not finding them and having that same exact thought, like, what the heck? Like, they're not even here. Like, are they a fly by night? And I not, I had not made the correlation to that that might be the way the newer, the younger generations coming up view, view Google, not so much as us losing out on a business opportunity, but us being judged as not credible if we don't even show up. So awesome. I'm so glad I, glad I have that next layer of Ajita for my SEO. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Stephanie. Hey, yes. <laughs> okay. So, so the thing is that... I mean, within SEO, I mean, so what we have to do is we have to, our websites have to be up. That's the first place that SEO starts at our website, right? And then what are the ways? I mean, there are, there are different ways that you can enhance your SEO. I know for one of them, it's like blog writing. I've been told, and you're, I'm going to double check everything I've ever been told against you right now. <laughs> so, I mean, a five page, five, five inch thick book on it. Yeah, I'm going to check everything I've ever been told. <laughs> um, but my understanding is that you can't just put your website up and walk away. I mean, you can't, let's do this. You can't just spend $6,000 to build your website and walk away. That's not enough. What you have to do is every week you have to update it with information because the Google search little bot thingies don't like it if it sits there with no words new words on it is that a true statement is that a true understanding well it's not so much how frequently you're updating the website it's the quality of the website content that matters okay. it could be uh, really amazing content in the form of how to's buyers guides uh, checklists uh, worksheets um, you know, extensive articles that stand the test of time that are just evergreen, amazing content. And Google's going to reward you for that month after month, year after year, because you've put all that effort in and you've created something remarkable. Oh. And when I say remarkable, I'm using Seth Godin's definition worth remarking about 
as uh, you know, the, the way for you to think about how this needs to uh, rise above all the noise, all the other content that's out there on the internet. So I need to create something that will help the reader really get it and um, add value for that reader. And I also need to do it in a way that it's it stands apart from everything else out there. There's so many articles, so many blog posts about interior design, about um, having a design sense, about uh, feng shui, about anything and everything, right? Right. How are you going to create something that's unique and uniquely valuable? How you, are we going to do that? <laughs> yeah, so you need to think in terms of something that has a hook. Or an angle to it. Okay. And if let, let's say that you're trying to get on TV. Okay. So I had 11 TV appearances last year. Okay. In order to get on TV, I needed to have a hook. I couldn't just say, "Well, let me talk to your audience about SEO and how important Google is." I'm like, uh, yeah, no, no, thanks. <laughs> we got a we had a thousand of those in line, right? Yeah, and and the 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 viewers don't really care, really. Mm. They use Google all the time, sure, and maybe many of them have websites. These viewers, though, are, they're not pulled by their heartstrings. There's no emotional connection there. There's no intrigue or mystery. It's just it's pretty flat. So if you try to accomplish the same thing online, you'll get the same kind of results, which will be crickets. So I contact TV producers with a pitch that includes a hook to it, multiple hooks, in fact. So they want something that's local, right? Because if it's Phoenix, uh, a Phoenix TV station, they want something related to Phoenix or at least Arizona, not just the West Coast or mm. the U.S. They want something that is timely. It's not like I came up with a, with a book a year ago and now I want to get some press for it. And I go, okay, well, that's not really that interesting to our, our viewer because that's last year's news. Old news. Okay, so timely uh, hook is, is really important. But here's the, the, the best one of all is the emotional hook. So if you wanted to get on TV, here's a secret weapon for you. In, involve a dog on the segment. So you want to <laughs> teach how to use Google. You want to teach how to get to the top of Google. Figure out how you can work a dog into the segment. Okay. Or whatever the topic is. Like right. I want to teach some valuable concept about uh, interior design or, or some aspect of interior design, like what, how to use feng shui in your interior design. How can I talk about feng shui and uh, get a dog on the segment? Maybe I can do it with uh, you know, how, how, to, um, how pet owners, dog owners can feng shui their home. Right, 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 right. Right. And then I bring the dog from a local shelter and the dog's available for adoption, blah, blah, blah. So now we got serious emotional hooks going on. Now apply that same concept to content you're writing for your blog. Okay, I, I need a hook. I wanna write about, let's say, feng shui and how that applies to interior design. Good interior design is always feng shui. Let's say that's my, my presupposition and I wanna, my, my hypothesis, I wanna prove that, right? Okay. In my, in my blog post. What am I going to do that's remarkable that gets people to notice, like almost gets them to do a double take, you know, like clickbait mm. headlines, you know, and number six will blow your mind and it never does. Right, right. You right. click on the article and <laughs> right. like, oh, well, that was a total non-starter. <laughs> right. So you have to deliver on the goods here. You, you make a promise in the headline and it really needs to um, be met in, in, in the actual article or content piece. But how, how do you get something about feng shui to really pop. Um, so one of the things I do, because I don't have all the answers, I do what's called R&D. You might think of that as research and development. Mm -hmm. R&D could also mean rip off and duplicate. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I love BuzzFeed for the viral content they create. They are valued at over a billion dollars. These guys know what they're doing. And they have a whole army of viral journalists, viral content writers working for them. So I want to just kind of see what they're up to. If I type into, into Google interior design or and let's stay with this topic of feng shui. So feng shui uh, and then site colon buzzfeed.com. That's what I'm typing into Google. So S-I-T-E 
the colon character and then buzzfeed.com. There's no space after the colon. And what this does is it looks for the phrase feng shui anywhere on the BuzzFeed site and nowhere else. So I'm only looking in Google at BuzzFeed pages. And I can see really cool ideas here that I can R&D. Like, oh. how feng shui are you? Take the quiz. <laughs> I love that. That's so cool. Right. 14 easy tips that will help you be happier in your home. Hint, you know, feng shui is the secret weapon or whatever. And, and uh, 19 tips to make your bed even more cozy. Or here's a list of things you should never give a Chinese guest. <laughs> and 28 modern ways to be more spiritual. I mean, these are great, right? 54 right. ways to make your cubicle suck less. Well, just replace cubicle with like your your pantry right. or your bathroom or your uh, your hallway or your living room or your entrance, whatever, right? So, so many ideas here. You don't just copy it exactly. You use this for inspiration. And so now you got a hook, like... 54 ways to make your bathroom, your guest bathroom suck less. <laughs> Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds like something I'd want to read. I'd at least want to click on. Maybe so <laughs> okay. So I have a few questions in there. Okay. So first of all, are we saying that the premise with this BuzzFeed is that it is a pro like what you said, these are proven. It's not so much, in other words, it's not so much that BuzzFeed is making these titles, topics, whatever, like, you know, 10 ways to make your bathroom not suck less. It's not that we're saying that they've made these titles important and an interesting hook. It's we're saying that you're explaining to us that they have already gathered the most you know, search for or viral the most read articles and put them there. So we're saying that this is basically the gold standard for the things. Somebody wrote that basically somebody independently wrote an article, how to make something not suck, right? And then BuzzFeed was like, wow, 90 billion people clicked on that article. Let's put that in BuzzFeed. So then we then say, as people who are r and ding this, saying, huh, that's a topic that everybody loves. Let me make a play on that. Is that what you're saying? Kind of. Okay. Right. So I'm not assuming that they did keyword research before uh, writing the article. I no, don't know but... that they know that these are the most popular topics or keywords. And that's why they wrote the article. What I do know, though, is they know how to create hooks. Right. They know how to pitch um, a, a TV producer on a segment and get booked. Not that they're doing that, but that that's the thinking that they're very good at, and that's what you need to become very good at as well in order to get links to your website from bloggers, especially the influential bloggers that really count as far as Google rankings are concerned. And then you're going to rise uh, uh, to the top of the search results. And it's not just that blog post. It's your entire site. It's the rising tide that lifts all boats. When you get a link from like a super popular, uh, authoritative, trusted blog or media site, let's say CNN.com, loves uh, something that you had written and links to it, that's going to be so powerful. Google's going to think very highly of your entire website, not just the article that they link to. So how are we getting that connection? That's, I'm lost right there. So we like, – okay, I have to break this down. So you're suggesting – I'm following this – that we look for inspiration on BuzzFeed and we do this Google search and we, we type – just go through it again, site semicolon buzzfeed.com, but we put uh, the title colon. in. Site colon. Yeah. So we put in, say, bookshelf styling. That's the darn thing I always use. <laughs> okay. Bookshelf styling site colon – no space buzzfeed.com then yeah. we're going to come up with every article on buzzfeed that talks about bookshelf styling we read a few we go oh oh my goodness i, it's, I love that idea and i can totally bounce all around that and not make it sound and not plagiarize it but i that made me have an inspiration so now i go and i write this blog post and i put it onto my website let's make an assumption that i've written it very well let's not say like all the stuff that we know we can't do like i've had grammatically incorrect and not poorly written and all so let's make an assumption that we, we we create a work of art. We've got done a beautiful blog post. It has a very similar angle to the proven angle that we found in BuzzFeed. 
how does CNN now find it and link to it? I mean, we're just like, that's our first blog post that we did with real legs to it. Are we saying that that happens after one or two years because we've done this every week or this hook angle just makes this blog post have bigger legs and bigger spread than a blog post that we did on bookshelf styling, but that didn't nearly have the same like pizzazzy hook to it? Yeah, so these are great questions. <laughs> I, I love your thought process on this. And there is a disconnect between just creating some amazing piece of content, something remarkable, posting it to your blog. Right. And it's then like magic, somehow right? magically people <laughs> yeah. notice it That's and what I'm think, saying. wow, this is great. I'm right. going to link to it. <laughs> That's the part we need to know, that middle part there. <laughs> yeah. So let me, let me, uh, let me illuminate. Okay. That. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So there are two processes that I do in tandem that will help with the discovery of this amazing, remarkable content that I've created. <laughs> One is I will use a tool to outreach to influencers, and I'm not just targeting social media influencers. I am targeting influencers as far as you know, Google uh, sees them. So the influencers that are fantastic and, and just huge in Instagram, for example, or in Facebook, are not the same uh, influencers as far as Google's concerned. So Google sees certain blogger as a big influencer because they have a lot of powerful links pointing to their site, not because they have a lot of followers on Instagram. Oh, okay. So there's so different criteria. So I need criteria. to look at that distinction. Like I'm looking for influencers as far as Google sees them. How do I we know that? I call them the Linkerati. Okay? The Linkerati. So like, I love kind of like the Illuminati, <laughs> but... These are the, the Linkerati who have a lot of... I love when I get a belly goals. laugh. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, okay, so we're targeting the Linkerati. <laughs> and how the heck do we find them? Well, we use a tool. Okay. We're not going to do it by hand. We're not going to do it by... <laughs> we just lock. call out the front door. Where the heck are the Linkerati? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They might, they might come and arrest you. So you got to figure out how do I reach these people? There are tools that will help you. Uh, one tool, tool that I use, my tool of choice is Pitchbox. Okay. And, uh, that only, not, not only identifies the Linkerati for you and it's on a per topic basis. So I could put in a keyword such as interior design, such as feng shui, such as, um, what was the, st uh, bookshelf, the bookshelf styling? Bookshelf styling. <laughs> Very <laughs> important topic. Just I'm telling you. <laughs> I, I, I believe you. I totally believe you. And I, I believe I have not done it. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm ripe to learn uh, about bookshelf styling. So now I've identified some influencers uh, using this tool. I've set a minimum threshold, like uh, let's say Moz Rank or. Uh, trust flow, or, you know, whatever the, there are multiple metrics you can choose from. So I have this minimum threshold. These are the people I want. They have to have at least this much authority, at least this much importance as far as Google's concerned. And now with that list, uh, that uh, database essentially of these influencers, then I want to come up with a campaign idea or an outreach angle. That's where my hook comes in again. Okay. Because let's say that my article or blog post is about, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, let's, how, yeah, let's do the. Um, you want to stay with the feng shui because that's where your brain is. It's fine with me. <laughs> bookshelf styling. Uh, okay. let's say, um, so 18 ways to be more Modern ways to be more spiritual. 19 way tips to make your bed even more cozy. Let's find uh, some some bookshelf style. I don't know if this is pretty <laughs> unique top. So I don't know if BuzzFeed's covering it, but we'll find out. <laughs> it might not be as pressing for the well, rest no, of the world. <laughs> 24 bookshelves that will mildly arouse any book lover. Say, I told you. <laughs> See that sounds that sounds sexy. That sounds intriguing, mysterious, and and um, whenever you have cognitive dissonance or uh, counterintuitive sort mm. of headlines or something that's intriguing or mysterious, makes you do a double take. Mm. You know you're onto something. Right? Although so, I have to say that sounds more like it's going to tell people about the actual content of the titles. 
You know what I mean? But uh, that's okay. That's true. That's true. Yeah, we I could, though. But by, by the way, an interior designer could play on the same sort of words and, and make it sound as though you're talking about 24 really fabulously styled bookshelves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I interrupted you. So go ahead. Okay. So now we have, we've done our, we've used our pitch box tool and we've identified the influencers in the interior design blogging world that Google values as opposed to us and us as our evaluation from a pretty standpoint. And you were smart, you were smart, you were about to tell us how we are going to do this outreach and this angle that involves them. Yeah. So uh, just to clarify with the prospects that we're identifying to outreach to, Mm -hmm. they don't have to be interior design bloggers. Okay. This is real, a really, really important point. Okay. In fact, there's two points here. One is you don't have to write the blog post for your target audience. In fact, many times you shouldn't be because your target audience are not the linkerati. Uh, mm. Your target audience are, you know, potential clients, and they don't have important websites as far as Google sees them. Wow. So we're writing content that's geared to the linkerati now. Wow. So and secondly. The fact that you're uh, targeting not just bloggers in the interior design space, but bloggers who have ever talked about bookshelf styling. That Mm -hmm. might include scrapbookers. That might include mommy bloggers. That might include uh, uh, people that are just... Organizers, anybody, right? Realtors. It could be all different industries that might talk about that. It could be... Yeah, yeah, okay. Exactly. And, wow. and those are all going to be valuable links. Sure, ideally, a, a link from the most important, powerful, authoritative interior design site on the internet linking to you would be great. Right. But I would love to get not super relevant links, too, from really important sites like CNN.com is not an interior design website. But if I can get a CNN link, that's going to be amazing for my business. This is a really new thought for us on the show, I have to say, because this is a a tiny bit contrary to what we have been discussing for many, many months, Stefan, in that when we always say, be authentic, picture your ideal client, write to that ideal client, that attracts that ideal client to you and that ideal client, when they read your blog, they understand, hey, this person gets me. It's like she's talking to me or he's talking to me. And there's tremendous value in that. And I'm not going to sit here and say we throw the baby out with the bathwater, but this is an amazing new, you know, concept that the idea is that if you write a blog post that has legs and reaches, let's use CNN for an example, because you wrote it to the perspective of that, or even a scrapbooker, because you wrote it to the perspective of that, it's indirectly your target client is going to find you because your site is now going to rank higher when they do what we said in the beginning, interior design, my town, you know, USA or Italy or whoever the heck we are, right? Whoa. That's mind blowing. Mm-hmm. I have to say, that's pretty mind blowing. Yeah, it's a paradigm shift for sure. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Okay, so what we're saying then is now, do we you? So we are right now when we write with a mind to these linkerati, are we? overtly writing to them where we say, and for instance, in CNN, I heard this. <laughs> like, how do we write with a mind to some of these big linkerati? How does that technically, how do we technically do that with authenticity? Well, you, the way that you're writing is a style that is um, uh, very provocative and enticing, engaging. Um, it's not that dissimilar to clickbait, but you actually deliver the goods, right? With clickbait, you create something that sounds really amazing until you then click on it and it's like, sucker. Yeah, (laughs) there's nothing there. I got nothing for you. Here's a picture of a cat, you know, like, (laughs) oh. (laughs) (laughs) Joke's on you. (laughs) Okay. So, okay, but I'm not sure. So, like, I think that I would think that I want to write something that's really compelling and wonderful Anyway, when I was thinking about my target client, how am I making a little shift that attracts those other people? Like, ju- it's just okay. the angle? Um, uh, let me okay. give you a specific Sorry. example. Okay. 
this will, I think, really clarify it for our, our listeners. Okay. Uh, let's say that your target audience, your ideal client, has a seven hundred thousand to one point two million dollar home. They make uh, one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. The blah 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 blah. Right. So here's your ideal client. You normally write blog posts for it. Now, I'm going to say, well, you know, there's this trend called uh, tiny houses. Mm -hmm. It's kind of ridiculous, I think, you know, and I'm just like, <laughs> can you really, uh, live in this t thing that's tinier than, uh, than a closet? I don't know. And the, the bathrooms that we previously were building for all of ourselves. <laughs> yeah. I just, no, you know, no thanks. But, um, imagine that you, um, uh, you kind of rode on this on uh, on the coattails of this of this trending topic of tiny houses, and you 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 had like you had fun with kind of a makeover project. Like this is how to make over uh, a, a tiny house to make it um, you know look like you're a baller or something like that. I, um, I'm just making this right, up. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and it, you don't really want that person that's interested in this as a client because they want a tiny house or they have a tiny house or they want to look like a baller in a tiny house. It just seems weird, right? I, I don't know. Just, <laughs> But it's the sort of thing that would get the Linkerati interested. They're like, okay, I love the tiny house thing. That's really funny uh, and weird. And I love that th these are the hacks that will make your tiny house make you look like a baller. Okay, okay, that I got to read this. This this sounds intriguing. I'm 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 curious. That's very cool. I like right? it. Yes, because so, you're mixing in some expertise on your interior design, like you said. So it's not clickbait. You're giving something of value there, but you're not really thinking that the tiny house homeowner is your ideal client. Exactly. Okay, that's and and the person that's the linkerati person that you're you're writing for, you're clear that that's not necessarily a tiny house owner either right. but they're just curious about this weird trend right right, right? yeah so, so so now you can target people across all sorts of other verticals right now you can target people in in um uh even in reddit which mm. is the front page of the internet it, it's a social site and uh, it's a great way to get in front of a lot of Linkerati to get on the front page of Reddit or even just on the front page of an important subreddit, you know, like today I learned or whatever. So imagine that you have this piece of content already written. How are you going to what kind of angle or hook are you going to use in the outreach email so that they don't just hit delete because they get hit up all the time? If you're a blogger and you have any kind of authority at all, as far as Google's concerned, you are getting emails all the time. You're bombarded with them like, hey, I'd love to write a guest post for you, and I already have it written, and here it is. <laughs> like, delete, delete, delete. You know, get these all day long. So you need to stand above all the noise, and it's not good enough just having the hook for the article. You can't say, well, you know, this the tiny house thing is a, is a thing, and I'm sure that your readers will love to read about it. And it's like, ugh, delete, right? So you got to come up with something that is really uh, makes them, first of all, believe that you're legit, that mm. you're real, and this isn't a bot or some automated spam campaign. Um, it, you know, I loved your latest blog post, and I would love to contribute an article to your wonderful blog. And here's the top. <laughs> Right. Like, okay, you've never been to my site. You have clearly. no idea who I am and what I do yeah. and what I write about. <laughs> yes, and it's a robot. And right. It's a robot con trying to contact me. You right. know, some automated tool. So make sure that you're conveying that, hey, I'm a human. And secondly, I hand wrote this email. This is not ma uh, sent on mass. And third, this is actually really well thought out and clever. So to give you... A, uh, an example of this on steroids, I had a client uh, earlier in, in the summer do a um, an outreach to a journalist from the Denver Post. So this company has uh, buildings, Section 8 housing all across the United States, really nice Section 8 housing, like luxury uh, apartments. Okay. That Section 8. Really cool. So they're going to, they were doing a grand reopening. They completely gutted some big building in downtown Denver and they were going to do a big, um, 
uh, grand reopening celebration and you know ceremony and everything and they wanted my help with seo and and getting links and and social mentions and all that and i'm like okay you were about to send a press release out, weren't you? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> you are not sending a press release. <laughs> Ixnay on the press release. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Journalists hate getting press releases. It's it, it's so impersonal and treating them like a commodity. Uh, it's not cool. Mm. So we didn't do the press release. And the Denver Post was one of the top outlets that we wanted to reach. So I found a recent article that uh, was all about rising apartment prices in downtown Denver. It was only a couple weeks old, so it was still fresh. Mm. And I had my client write uh, a, an email to the journalist. And I'm like, before you send this, you are going to send this to me so I can approve it. And thank goodness I said that because it was a mini press release. He was about to send an email. I'm like, that is not okay. Here's how you're going to rewrite it. And he did. And second time around, it was amazing. It was very thought provoking and insightful and interesting. It had some trends and stats, and it was really good. And he mentioned that there, you know, here's an example of this new way of thinking about Section 8 housing and low income and da da da. We're about to do a grand reopening, and it's like in a week. And guess what? The Denver Post sent a jur journalist to cover that. Nice. And they have had a full article in the paper, not just on the website, about this uh, this new building. Wow. So apply that approach of I need to be like so laser focused on the individual and make them feel important and special. And like this is a well thought out communication. Because especially with the first um, outreach, with the very that that's the that's their first impression of you, and if you screw it up, you can't get that first impression back and do it over again. The, the, yeah, you just um, yeah. There's you, no you lost Plan it. B, right? You're just the the journalist has a bad taste in her mouth about it. So, but now, Stefan, what's the when you talk, that's like, that's a, a perfect example of a designer who might have an opportunity in a local area or wants to create an opportunity in a local area to come up with a hook, come up with an angle, follow. Uh, I, I have um, listened to podcasts on PR and marketing. And of course, some of the guests that have been on the show, they always suggest that you really know a particular journalist, journalist body of work, follow them on Twitter, you know, read the articles that they post on Twitter in different places and in, in the different uh, publications and so forth. So that when you pitch them, they actually can tell that you know them. And of course, your pitch has relevance to them. Okay, Amy Fleury was on the show. And she has a book called Recipe for Press. And she talked about this, like, don't just if the, the magazine is all about country living, don't send them your mid century, you know, modern furniture, you know, layout here because it's just like, really, do you know what I'm doing? What what our magazine is about? But what's the the other way? Like when you're talking about these this Linkerati, and when you were talking about Reddit, I mean, these are online places, big, huge online places, and is is and I've heard of Reddit. I I'm not very familiar with it, so. Is it the sort of thing, is Reddit like BuzzFeed, where it's a conglomeration of all different articles by all different journalists? Or And so to that point, are you supposed to do the same, find one or two that seem to be in your niche and just keep following their stuff? Like, I'm, I'm a little lost on that connection. Yeah. There. Okay. Well, before we delve into Reddit, let me just kind of step back and say, that, well, first of all, think of, of Reddit more like Facebook okay. and as a, as a community, as a social network, as a place to get the word out. Okay. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. Okay. So Reddit set aside for a moment. And now we have this um, idea that we're targeting, let's say, a, 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 whether it's a journalist or a blogger, somebody who is influential, mm -hmm. who is going to help us get the word out and we need to have a really solid pitch. Mm. And that pitch needs to incorporate um, the, the fact that we sent an individual email to them, that uh, it was well thought out and considered that uh, we have a, a really good angle or hook or idea, 
and that we understand their body of work, that this is not just, you know, hit and run sort of thing where um, I know nothing about them and I'm just hoping that I get a hit. Right. Okay. So I need to show all those in the email that I send, which is, uh, you know, it's, not so easy it's not, to do. Right. Not so easy. No, not to do it well, not to do it artfully, you know, without right. like 9,000 paragraphs that nobody's going to read. <laughs> so, so, so let's uh, take this idea of you have some sort of um, content piece, whether it's on uh, bookshelf styling or what have you. It, if it's got a great hook, like, um, uh, what was the latest hook that we came up with? Yeah, it was something about um, 24, I don't oh, know. Oh, bookshelves that will mildly arouse any book lover. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. So we have we have the hook for the article, the, the blog post. Now we need the hook for the outreach. Right. So let's say that you, as a recipient of an email, you have a, a blog that has some authority, and you get this email – and the person is asking a question or they're posing a, 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 you know, the, a maybe a collaboration of some sort. And it sounds really intriguing. Like, for example, let's say that your topic space is scrapbooking. And um, you are, as the emailer, the person with the, um, with the outreach, um, you know, uh, pitch, mm -hmm. you have this idea for um, yeah, incorporating bookshelf styling and scrapbooking into, um, you know, like bringing them together. And maybe you have an infographic as, um, you know, the, the, the format. The how-to of doing it. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, so no, because that's a legitimate it, topic. Somebody might just like scrapbooker might just have a hot mess of a bookshelf of all their books and an interior designer can suggest a beautiful way to use containers and la 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 to make their body of work look pretty on the shelf. Yeah. I like the yeah, idea. So, <laughs> so, so the scrapbooker has their understanding of their worlds, their readers, uh, you know, the, the, the trends and all that sort of stuff. You as the interior designer have your uh, expertise and your angle and your research and come to them with a collaboration and say, hey, I've been following booking blog for a while. I thought very highly of this thing that you wrote and I thought, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you, you add that insight like my client did uh, to that journalist at the Denver Post. Mm. And then you can either in that same email or in a follow-up email propose a collaboration like, hey, I'm working on this infographic about – uh, bookshelves and um, how to whatever, right? And right. I would actually love to do a collaboration with you and have a version of this uh, of this infographic that is specific to scrapbookers. Mm. I like it. I like right? it. And would you be willing and interested in participating? And then you don't even have to ask for the link because the best kind of of pitch is where it's going to scratch their own itch mm. to shout it from the rooftops about this content piece, right? So they're going to want to include the infographic on their blog and link to the original source, which is you, because you are the creator and the instigator of all this. They're going to want to shout it from the rooftops on social media as well, uh, their Facebook and and Pinterest as well. And, you know, that's uh, a great social network that has more um, – kind of evergreen uh, capability to it. Like you, you post something on Twitter and it, it's Gone. shelf life yeah. is so, so short. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to look back in your tweets from a week ago and see what you were up to. It's no. just gone. But Pinterest, way more uh, capability there to have something have, uh, have, a, have more staying power. Once it gets onto Pinterest, it continues to drive traffic and so forth. And that, Traffic might include the link Roddy, who are like, oh, wow, that's a really cool topic, really cool infographic, really great listicle of the top 10 things or whatever. I'm going to blog about that. And that's what you're after. 
It's really, um, it's interesting because the conversation is completely different than I expected it to be, but I can see how this is really the nugget of the success of SEO. At the beginning of the conversation, I asked you if the premise that I understood to be true was true, that you had to add new content to your website on a very regular basis in order for the SEO rankings to be high and for Google to love and adore it. And your answer was not necessarily. And I love it because what you're describing is the fact that if we think about some of these tactics, you know, really tapping into what's trending. And I think that I, I said it once and I'll repeat it again. I think that at least for me, I'll speak for myself, that I have lost that in a lot of the things that we've talked about in this last year and a half on the show. I have been so focused on speaking to our authentic client, our authentic tar target client, that I, I've i never heard anybody describe the use of our website and our blog content in this way. However, it makes complete sense to me. And, and, and of course, you know, I would venture to say, Stefan, is if... Is, is this a true statement based on everything you just taught us? Is it a true statement to say that if you had a, a topic like this, say once a month, that was sort of, you know, you, you gleaned it from the inspiration of the, of Buzzfeed or whatever it might be. And you really are gearing towards an outreach to a specific thing that if you really do passionately love to blog about interior design, the other three posts that month could really be, you know, and this is how I decorated a bedroom and I really love it. Like, I mean, does that make sense that's okay right for sure for right. sure i okay. mean you'll have some amount of staple content that's targeted to your ideal client your ideal prospect and then you will have these remarkable content pieces that stand up above the rest above the noise and get you noticed and get you links but as i said you have to do the work you can't just hope that people stumble onto your blog and to this remarkable content piece, this remarkable blog post that you've created. Uh, it's not, what was that movie where they uh, build it and they will come? Right. Uh, field, field of Dreams, field right? Field of Dreams, right, right. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's such an overused phrase, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll use it anyway. So it's not build it and they will come because you'll end up not getting noticed. Right. So you you'll do have to do some... these other steps of yeah. outreach is what you're saying. You have to put some yes. time. It's no different than trying to, well, interior designers understand that concept because it's no different than trying to get your work featured in a magazine. And, you know, the, the number of people that have been on the show that said, oh, I just got approached to have a full spread in a national magazine is like zero. Okay. <laughs> you know, everybody else is like, well, I consistently did this and I consistently did that and I consistently did this. And then came the magazine offer. You know what I mean? So I think that uh, we get that concept of the outreach and of making it good. But I think we, uh, again, I just speak for me. I misunderstood that that one post every how often, the one that you said that's remarkable, that stands above the others, and that is the one that attracts the the, the outside people, the linkerati, is not necessarily your best post that you really know shows your work and your talent and everything else. It's more of something that, you know, it's, 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 well, you know, it's, it's so funny because it always reminds me when people talk about making a pitch to uh, whether it's another blogger or it's an ed editor or something. And they say the things that you said, make sure you know the, what their work is like, make sure you make an honest and authentic reference to their work in something that you read that you liked and make sure that, you know, you're not just all about you, that you, you, you do something, you're offering some value to them. And every time when somebody goes through that little list and they're explaining that to us, I think it's like, I always say to myself, well, it's like dating. You just don't walk up to somebody in a bar and say, I'm fabulous. And I think, you know, you know, this, that, and the other thing about myself. And these are, these are things I do and, you know, want to date me. It's like, no, when you want to impress somebody and you want to date somebody, you talk about them. You're like, you have great eyes and, you know, you have this and I love your, the way your mind thinks and la la la. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so, right. but the thing is like this one plot blog post a month or whatever it might be, it's like putting on that really killer outfit now. It's like, okay, now. 
now we're really going to try and reel that baby in. Right? That's right. That's a great, that's a great analogy. I like that. Yeah. So, okay. I like it. And then you can be in your sweatpants the other three days of the other three weeks of the month. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So I think it's, I think it's amazing. I mean, honestly, I, I know that I could talk to you forever about this because I know we just scratched the surface. Although I do feel like we gave a really good chunk of information for somebody who's interested in trying to build more traffic to their website to get to the website. And I'm just going to take a moment to ask you one other question because I have been wanting to announce this anyway. And this is a great opportunity, I think, to do this. So I have invited an interior designer, Laura Thurman, to guest blog on my Window Works website. So just so you know, I, I have this podcast and I talk to interior designers about their business and helping them grow their business. But I also have a window treatment company where my husband and myself and my cousin, we do window treatments for retail consumers and to the trade and awnings, okay? And so in an effort to you know, reach out to the design community and give some people an opportunity to maybe have them get some exposure because of course the window work site is getting a lot of visits now based on the podcast. Uh, and also for me, let's be real. It's a way for me to have somebody writing some great content on there. What would you say? So this is Laura Thurman. That's going to start doing was well, probably by the time this airs, she will have started. And I thought what I would do is just to continue sharing this announcement with everybody is that I'm going to invite a designer to, if they would like to do this every quarter for window work. So Laura is going to do it September, October, November, December, and then I'll invite somebody else in January. So just putting that out there if anybody's interested. But the thing about it is, Stefan, is based on everything you just told us, do you have just one or two tips that come to mind for Laura and myself? And I want to share with you my why for doing this in addition to that little thing, my goal. I would love, A, of course, to have more consumer traffic driven to the window work site by having a talented interior designer who happens to be a talented writer write great information posts about the fall season and all the myriad of things that happen to designing and decorating in the fall season. But I also was very clear that I want Laura to be able to have a place to express her talent and to pepper it often through this post that she's available for e-design because I would love for her to get some wins out of this as well. So it's not just about me. I And I, I specifically the criteria when I invited a designer to do this was a designer who, because she's not in New Jersey, she's in Tennessee, who could have the opportunity to earn a client off of off of her guest experience at Window Works. So with those criteria in mind, do you have one or two tips for Laura and myself that you think that we should be thinking about and considering for these couple of months, Stefan? Yeah. So first of all, wipe from your vocabulary guest blogger, guest post, guest blog, anything like that, because that puts a big target on your back. Google hates guest posts because most of those are for SEO purposes and they're low quality. <laughs> and uh, Google has talked about guest posting and guest blogging is not uh, a very good tactic. So I can't tell you how glad I am I asked you this question because I literally emailed Laura this morning and said, why don't you start with a whole post about who you are and how you're guest blogging for Window Works and we'll introduce you to my community. <laughs> okay. Er Breaks on. Yeah. Okay. So what do we, yeah. we, we don't pretend that she works for, we don't pretend anything. We just have her byline on it, period. Is that it? Well, you could do that or you could say we have a new contributor. New contributor. Okay. Right? So, so if you're a magazine, you have contributors, you have columnists, you don't have guest bloggers. You know, I have to just say, you know what it is? That's like crazy pants. That's just semantics of words. But okay, I'll, I I will accept it because you're an expert, but that makes me crazy. But go ahead. Okay, so new contributor <laughs> Well, think about this from, from Google's perspective. Mm -hmm. If nine out of 10 blog posts that have the phrase guest post or guest blog are garbage, are low value content? Oh, out in the world, not because m m the one that I would be using, but but basically as a rule of thumb, you're saying Google uh, finds most of these are unworthy. Correct. Oh, okay. And All so right. you are you are opening yourself up to unwanted scrutiny by saying, "Hey, 
here comes the guest post. <laughs> this was worth the price of admission right here, this little question and answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So right. new so that, contributor. So that's, right. So that's first thing. Mm -hmm. And then what I, the process I use for, um, for content uh, strategy and, and just kind of an editorial calendar is what are the hooks and what are the topics? So I figure out the topic first, then the hook, um, and then the headline, okay. and then the article. Okay. So your guest blogger, your your new contributor, is going to just do that same process because that process works. You don't think of the headline first, and then what the 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 topic is because you kind of put in the cart before the horse. I need to know that my headline actually has a hook in it. Okay. Right. So you, you have I'll, I'll take one of your uh, previous blog post uh, uh, headlines as an example. Three reasons to motorize your window treatments. <laughs> where's 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 the hook in that? Well, is I'm going to tell you what, this is so funny because I have had discussion after discussion with people who say for SEO that you have to make your title the stupid, crazy thing that people are going to Google and not this wonderful creative thing. So I guess, so to me, it's like, you know, how do you motorize your window treatments or reasons to motorize your window treatments? No. <laughs> Isn't that well, what somebody's going to Google? Well, that's a really Google? boring sounding <laughs> title. And I know. I, yeah. So they might type in window treatments. Motorize your window treatments probably isn't getting a much uh, search volume. And here's a great tool to see if what you're uh, thinking of targeting is actually a popular keyword or not. There's a tool called Keyword Explorer from Moz. And it's a paid tool, but you can actually use it two times a day for free. Hmm. Uh, two, for two queries a day for free, anybody, uh, just go to moz.com slash explorer. And uh, let's type in, as an example here, window treatments. <laughs> okay, so I doubt that motorize your window treatments or tr window <laughs> treatments motorizing or some, anything like that is going to get go any Go ahead, volume. let's see. Let's just yeah. see. <laughs> But window treatments by itself as a phrase, mm -hmm. that's about 11,500 to 30,300 monthly searches. And that's within 95% accuracy. I know it's a range. It's right, not but an I can't exact number, title but it's every post window accuracy. treatments. No, you wouldn't do that. You, <laughs> okay. you need titles that, sure, it's important to have the keyword that you're targeting for that particular article or post in the title of it, in the headline. That's great. And important. And if that ruins your readability and intrigue and uh, engagement, you've done it wrong. It has to do both in the same in the same uh, okay. headline. So you have a better one here. I'll give you an example of a better one from your blog. Um, top uh, top five mistakes homemakers make when DIYing drapes. Okay. So you would probably like to uh, rank for drapes, but that's a little too generic and that's unlikely to, to rank for that. You're not targeting a specific phrase uh, like motorize your window treatments. Okay. That one, it's more targeted to the reader. Like I want to intrigue you and interest you, build up your um, – your desire to read this article. Okay. So now I want to share better. something right here just as, so everybody knows and gives an, I want to give a nice plug. This is to Kate, the socialite. That post was written by Kate, the socialite, the top, you know, 10 DIY or whatever the post was. So Kate, the socialite, Stefan, so you know, is an um, consultant that specializes in creating content for interior designers and window treatment uh, professionals for their blogs and so forth and for their Facebook and for their Instagram and everything. And her, Kate did a lot of blog posts for my site and that was one of them. And so I thought, I just thought that was really awesome that, you know, you picked the one that she did that you said really had some nicer likes to it. So high five Kate. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to tell you, it's funny because um, there is a post that I wrote going back, I want to say, 
two years ago in the fall of 2015 on something about transom windows. I don't even remember what it was. And I've mentioned this on the show before. I have had, I literally just had an email two days ago from somebody who I don't know that sent me an email. And the first line was, I loved your post about transom windows. I was laughing and thinking to myself, there's somebody else out there that, you know, you know, la, 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 went on with the email and then asked me some questions about how to decorate her transom windows. And I've probably had about a half a dozen Strangers. I had one woman from the middle of the country. I don't recall where she was, but somewhere, Oklahoma, Kansas, something. And she emailed me and she was like, I love your post on transom windows. Do you mind if I ask you some questions? Sent me pictures. I told her where I thought she should do it. And I said, you know, follow up with me if you ever do it. And like four months later, she sent me another email. I did it. Look how much better my windows look than they did before. And it's just so funny that, you know, I guess there's certain topics, like you said, just have more legs than others or the way you word them. Maybe that post you know, the title was good. I don't remember what it was to tell you the truth, (laughs) but it works. Okay. So we want to say that for anybody that's collaborating in a way that I am, that we don't introduce them as a guest blogger. We introduce them as a new contributor or a a columnist for our, our uh, website, our blog. And that we want to make sure that I speak to Laura about that. She has her topic first, her hook second, her headline third, and then she comes up with her article. So this is awesome. Now, you are available for hire. I mean, this is just insane how much content you gave. And I, this is a long interview and I appreciate your time. Um, but it's not like I, I it's uh, honestly, so it's S T E P H A N Spencer.com W W W S T E P H A N Spencer.com. And you do consulting Stefan with people on helping them. Do you do done for you? Do you just do consulting? Tell us a little bit about your services. Cause you're like a sort of a rock star. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I do offer consulting. I will help, uh, set the strategy for, your content marketing and link building. Um, I will audit your websites and find all the things that are broken (laughs) in terms of the SEO, Um, you know, kind of all the techie stuff that you're probably missing. Um, And I also coach. I give coaching on uh, SEO and online marketing. So if somebody doesn't want to uh, hire me for the the full consulting engagement, but has a a budget for uh, using me for coaching, then we'll have weekly calls and uh, then you do the homework and get the results and then, yeah, execute yourself. So, um, yeah. So either way is going to move move your business forward. You could also just pick up my book, which is a, you know, daunting thousand pages (laughs) and, Try and figure it out on your own. I do have some online courses that are a little easier than than that. Might be better. You know, we're visual people, a little more tactical. Yeah. No, that's so the online courses. I think would probably be an easy starting point as well, and they're very affordable. And there's, I have one on content marketing for getting links. Uh, A lot of the stuff we talk about in this episode, uh, and I go in much greater depth. To, uh, like how do you find the trending topics and that sort of thing. Um, there's BuzzSumo. I talk about how to use that. I show how to use I, I have you essentially stand behind my shoulder watching me use all these different tools, and I, I, wow. I walk you through the process. So uh, content marketing and uh, doing your own SEO audits. I um, uh, have one on, on social media marketing for SEO purposes because – using sites like Facebook and, and Reddit and Twitter and, and Pinterest and so forth to actually get the link karate to link to you is very powerful and misunderstood by a lot of people. Well, my head's swimming, honest to God. I feel like, you know, I have to tell you this. <laughs> What's going through my mind is I could have another podcast where every week I just ask you questions about SEO. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
Thank you. Thank you really, truly, very much. I, I have two pages of notes myself. I don't know how many pages anybody else was able to take when they didn't have to try and listen the way I needed to to be in this state of mind here. But I really do thank you so much and value everything you shared with us. I can't imagine the number of interior designers out there that are going to really benefit from some of these truly, really actionable tips. I mean, look at me. I, I'm, I hit the home run with asking you that last question. And thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome, Luann. And it was a real pleasure. And, um, yeah, in order to get the ROI, you need to put in the effort and, and do the work, take the action. So this is all great information. But if you don't do anything with it, and I'd say do it right away so you don't lose the momentum, do it right away and start getting some, uh, some ROI out of the time that you spent listening to this episode. That's a perfect way to end it, Stefan, because that's how we started it with the, that's what you're about and that's what your core is about taking action. So thank you again. I really do value you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining me again today for another episode of A Well-Designed Business. This podcast is a production of Window Works in Livingston, New Jersey, your trade resource for custom window treatments and awnings. Learn more about Window Works at www.windowworks-nj.com. All of our music is original music by Room 2 Productions. Please contact us if you want to learn more about original music for your business or your events.